All right, welcome to the February 12th, 2024 and credits Working Group meeting. This will mostly be a discussion between um, Mike and myself as I query him about features of an OnCreds V2. Um, but we'll use the early part of the session to get an update on where we are with the OnCreds in W3C format, the V1. Um, I'll go over the 02 release content. Um, I'm going to raise the question in the community about uh, a release 1.00 of an on-creds. I don't know why we haven't done that quite a long time ago, but um, we'll look at that. And then, as I say, most of the time will be Mike and I going back and forth about um, V2 ZKP capabilities. Um, we are recording, so others can uh, find out about this. Um, reminder, this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger meeting, so the antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation and the Code of Conduct of the Hyperledger Foundation are both in effect. All right. Um, the annual review of the non press project at the, um, that should be a capitalized TOC, and I am in editing mode. Um, uh, the Technical Oversight Committee, the Hi Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee is this Thursday, February 15th. Um, there's an upcoming um, ZKP workshop, April 24th, and IIW is before then. I guess I should switch that order. Okay, um, we have released an on-creds. Um, whoops, looks like I have got this in twice with both the same thought, but that's okay. Um, let's start with an on creds in W3C format. I see we've got um, two folks, one from each um, of the groups. Um, can we get an update on how it's going? Martin, you should almost be finished, I think. Um, yeah, I opened up Yarr in AFJ. I got some feedback from former Timo. Uh, I fixed that, or I, I will have that fixed by tomorrow, and then I hope to get it merged pretty soon. Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah. That was it. Uh, um, just want to, to ask one other thing, sorry. Um, there is one issue open in the Anon Kretz RS repo um, regarding the nonce of the proof request, which uh, it, it needs to be merged at least for inter interoperability um, between uh, Akatai uh, and AFJ, or at least we need to find a solution to that, I proposed okay. something. And we uh, didn't merge it before 020. Shoot, we did 020 this morning. Um, I hadn't looked at that one. My apologies. Um, I saw that one and I just had didn't have time to look at it at the time and haven't gone back to it. Um, okay, we'll look at getting that done as quickly as possible. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know which one that is. Uh, actually, do you have the number offhand? Uh, no, I searched quickly. Okay. One sec. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I've got them all. Um, uh, oh. It should be, I want to up by sort by updated because you updated it today, I think. Uh, no, Timog uh, made some comment today, if I remember yeah. correctly. Huh, I'm not seeing it. Is it a, and it's not a pull request. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, an Ocris RS. It should be in here if it's. Oh, did you do it in Credo? Uh, no, it should it should be there. Wait, I I'll search it and uh, post it. Okay. Okay. Um. Ken, do you have an update on uh, where the Occupy implementation is? Okay. 
All right. Martin, if you get that, let me know and I'll chase it down today. Uh, I, I have uh, written it in the chat. It's in oh, the Arnoncred spec repo. Sorry, not in the Arnoncred. Ah, okay. I knew it was somewhere. Sorry about that. Now, you know what? Maybe putting it there. Oh, right. Challenge and nonce. Okay. I will take a look at this one today and chase it down. Um, I remember your comment and I should have, uh, of it. I think this is a bad idea. I should have. <laughs> I should have, well, I knew that was important, but I just didn't have time to look at it at the time. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a 020 release. We may have a 030 release coming up soon. But anyway, that was um, completed. Um, 58 PRs total. A bunch of them were, at least 10 of them were, um, uh releases or 11 of them were releases but that's okay um uh, but anyway a significant milestone um uh, includes all, obviously all of the w3c format um changes i'm going to do a summary of it and and um make sure we get a change log and and get something um released about this so sean might you might see something coming your way um uh, so yeah, we've got that done. So that's the zero to zero release completed. And that just happened this morning. Um, I, I've wondered from a realizing both from an Akapai Aries, um, and an on creds, why we've never done a 1.0. And so we'll likely be, uh, raising in the community, the conversation of doing a 1.0 release. I'm not really sure why we don't ever do that. Um, all of our work, we tend to keep doing minor releases of a zero product versus a one. So we'll be taking a look at that. I don't know if anyone has any comments on that, um, but it seems long overdue for an on creds that we have a 1.0, at least the V1 release. All right. Um, an on creds V2 ZKP. So at this point, I'm jumping into more of a question and answer for um, Mike Lauder, um, but people are welcome to join in and participate in this. Would love to have others um, comment on this, um, but this session will be all about um, V2 capabilities. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about, Mike, was adding VBS Plus to the library. Um, what do you have a, uh, if we can get someone to do that, or do you have guidance on how to do that and what roughly what the effort is to get that included? Um, so I've kind of started on just writing the abstraction layer. Okay. Um, but then once that's in place, which isn't very much, then adding BBS plus should just be trivial. <clears throat> so I, I have kind of started on that. Uh, if, if, we can take any BBS plus implementation we want. We can, you know, it doesn't matter. Okay. If you want it externally or if you want it in Agora, I don't care. Uh, it really doesn't matter. The The key is to just write the abstraction, which I'm just about done with. Sorry, I've been kind of yeah. slammed with other stuff. And my wife had a surgery last week, so I've been oh, no. caretaking <laughs> for yeah. the last few days. Okay. Um, the reason this is so important is because there's – a ton of interest in BBS plus, but um, it's all at the lower level and an, by including it in an on creds, but basing it on BBS plus, I think we would get, we're more likely to get more interest um, and more um, uh, more contribution to it. So that's why I wanna look at getting that done sooner than later. So I would see this as sort of the first priority at getting others involved. So um, let's, um, if we can figure out, define the task, um, it would be very helpful. There's just three. It's mainly okay. just three. The first is the abstraction layer. The second is integrate it. The third is add the statement and verify layer. That's it. It's not much different than 
punchable sanders it's yeah basically... that's what i'm assuming is it's it's just going to be a repl uh, a parallel um right. yep piece <clears throat> okay okay um recall that um we did uh we created in um hang on one sec i'll, I'll probably call it up this way um, oh yeah So if you want, I can add it as an issue to the repo. Yeah. I, I think it's there cool. already. I think it's there already. So um, we can include that uh, samples. Okay. Um, so we have a set of examples in here of the various objects, and we've talked about these in the past. Um, one thing I realized was missing um, was the what I would call a revocation, a specific, uh, a, a revocation registry. So we do need to publish that, correct? No. Uh, don't we have to publish the accumulator so the verifier has it? If, oh, okay. So that's what you mean by registry. So yeah, yeah. just the accumulator and the verifying key, that's it. Okay. That's what I thought. Verifying key and accumulator. And would we, and, and those are both pretty small, right? Yeah, the accumulator is 48 bytes. The verifying key is 96 bytes. So yeah. I'm talking so, 100 byte registry. So it 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 makes sense to keep to publish both every time. I mean, you can. You, once the verifying key's up, it shouldn't change. Yeah. Um, so when I look at a cred def, where did I put that? Yeah, here. I mean, this is the revocation key right here, right? Uh, the revocation verifying key, yep. And the yeah. revocation registry is the on line 24. Yeah. So the there's an identifier value. of some kind, there's a verifying key, and then there'd be a, 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 a way to resolve it. Yep. And that's all that would be in there. So a way to resolve it, the revocation registry, the verifying key, and then the accumulator, which is... Well, you see um, revocation registry line 24, that is the accumulator value. It's mislabeled, but that's Oh, what... this is the accumulator. Okay. That's okay, it. Okay, so those are the two values that get published over and over every time the state changes. Every time credentials are revoked or unrevoked, that's the accumulator. Every time the accumulator changes, yes. Changes, right. Definitely on a, revo on a revoke, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that makes the you know both the definition and the re and and the registry, but there's no difference between a definition. So in a non creds one, we have a revocation reg um, rev reg definition and an entry. The definition is sort of always picked up and and it contains the initial elements, and then the entry or or sorry, the in, uh, the verifying key and so on. And then the entry contains the state changes. And in this case, all we do is we have a revocation registry and it contains both the verifying key and the accumulator every time. Agreed? You could do that, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, so if, like I said, if you want to save on size, you could just publish the accumulator every time. And maybe yeah. the ID of the registry is the verifying key. Ah, uh -huh. okay. There's only one key, right? Yeah. And it's unique enough. That way it's a self-certifying identifier. Yeah, that in which case the only thing we're publishing is the accumulator every time. We're spending more. Yeah, yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can publish any revocations or uh, or additions at all. You just publish yeah. the, the one thing, and that's it. Yeah. So right now, the way you've got it is you've you've sort of merged that into the ver the what what I'm calling the credential definition, but it really doesn't need to be. Correct. Okay. How does verifiable encryption work? Um, I had I had some image in my head that's not quite right. So. 
Issuer setup. Do they need to do anything? Issuer needs. What does the issuer so, need to do? Okay, so verifiable encryption can be done by any party. All that requires is they create a key pair. That's it. Okay. So if the issuer wants to support it or a third party auditor, all they need is a key pair. And it, and it would be a PS or a BBS plus key pair? Um, BLS only. Oh. That's it. Doesn't even need to be BBS plus, doesn't need to be okay. PS or any of those. Could just be BLS, a BLS key pair. Okay. So issuer, auditor, et cetera. Okay. So issuer setup. Do they have to have the public BLS key? Uh, the Well, the issuer has to publish the public key somewhere. The public key is basically an encryption key. Yeah. Public key has to be published somewhere. Hold on. Pu oh, published. Yeah, yeah. Can it be in the credential itself? You like signed into the credential? Yeah. Does that make any sense? No. Not really. Okay. Dependent of the credit. I mean, you you can literally sign whatever you want in the credential, but sure. <laughs> so I mean, if you wanted to, you could, but there's no reason for it. Okay. So they publish it somewhere, the public key. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe in the same place as the credential verifying key. I mean, yeah. In the cred def, if that's that's where I oh, put yeah. it. Oh, right. Of course. Okay. It's optional, but for now, like in my examples, I just do it every time. Okay. For my purposes. Yep. Okay. Um, during issuance, do they do anything with it or nothing? Nothing. Okay. Holder verifier time. Um, oh, is there any, it can be used on any data element, right? It's not specifically, you, you don't have a, a particular piece of data that can be. No, it can be any, any claim, any claim. Okay. So the way I had thought about it was, you know, like you have a credit card number and the issuer gives the holder the credit card number and that is the thing that would be encrypted when when passed to the verifier. But that's that's yep. not necessary. It could be any value. Any value. I mean, I've given you that example before. Like if you want to buy something, then... You know, I encrypt the credit card number, give it to the verifier. The verifier knows that credit yeah. card number is a part of the credential and then gives the encrypted ciphertext to the issuer who then decrypts and goes, oh, okay, yep, I'll, given this proof, that's proof of consent, I'll charge the credit card number I just decrypted with the amount that the verif verifier is asking and et cetera. But the other use case is you can encrypt um say the claim used for revocation, you can encrypt yep. that, give it to the verifier. And then if the verifier ever needs to de-anonymize this person, they can give the ciphertext back to the issuer. The issuer decrypts it and goes, ah, I know who this credential was. So you can say it's the credential ID, the revocation ID, whatever, right? They get that unique number, they decrypt it, and then they can revoke whoever it was. That's another use case. I mean, the sky's the limit. You can literally encrypt just about anything. So Yeah, but the point is that when you issue it, it's not associated with any specific claim. It's just given, it's just published. The public key is just published somewhere. Yep, that's right. Okay. Then the holder says, hey, I want you to. No, the verifier says, I need right. you to give me a verifiable ciphertext about okay. 
one of the claims. So the so the verifier has to know it. And if we go over to, uh, let's go here. Kind of a nice way for the verifier to request the holder get put some skin in the game. It says, hey, if I ever need to, I can ask a third party to decrypt this. Right. So, okay. What? So this is an example of that. I've, I've got a presentation request. I'm saying I want one of the... Claim zero to be verifiably encrypted. Yep. That's the, the revocation. Me? That's the revocation claim. Okay. And what's the message generator? Uh just think of everything in here as like a parameter. So there so there's the message generator is which uh generator was used for um that claim. Where where so is the anything? Where where does the verifier get the message generator? Oh, that would be part of of whoever generated the key. They publish that too. What key? The verifiable encryption key. So when the key is published, they would say, "Here's the generator I used." Also. Okay, so you have. Oh, okay, so you have to publish a, a generator as well. Yep. Okay. Usually, usually it's just the the base point, the default one, but it doesn't have to be. With a message generator. Yeah. In our case, the message generator and key are both 48 bytes. So it's pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. So a public key and a message generator are published. Yep. That's it. Okay. And, and a message generator is a, a point on the curve or something like that? Yep. Just like the public key. Okay. Just think of it as like maybe two public keys. Maybe that's the easiest way okay. to think of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. That, yeah, then the encryption my... key, this this yeah. is the public key? Yep. That's the public yeah. key. Um, the ID, this is the same as this. What's the reference ID? That's the statement oh. where the claim comes from. So if you scroll up, that would be the signature one. Okay says where my verify how do i know this claim was signed yeah that's all okay so that that's part of the set of statements yep. and then this is what i want encrypted this that's is the claim number that you uh, from this from the from the credential you're going to use i want claim 0 to be encrypted yep yes and this could be the this doesn't have to be a, an index. This could be a the name of it, right? It could be anything. It's just a way that we know how to look it up. That's all. Okay. Okay. I just um, chose indexes because those are the easiest when coding. <laughs> so the two keys. So all you need is the the public information and the and the attribute you want to do. The rest of it's just linking everything together. That's right. Okay. Certain claim reference to the two public keys. Okay, reference to the attribute to be published or to be encrypted. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so holder just generates the encrypted value. Yeah, we call it a verifiable ciphertext, if that's... Uh, 
Um, and that's going to be unique every time. Well, how is, oh, because it's going to include the nonce? Yes, there's a nonce associated with the encryption. So it does change every time. Similar to like AES or any other ciphertext system. Yep. Okay, so now we have a unique value that we've got a nonce, we've got a generator, we've got a public key associated with it. We've got the value that the holder put in. They gave that to the issuer, decryption process. So you must have to pass at least the, the, the ciphertext Plus nonce, right? Uh, I I basically count the nonce and the ciphertext as one thing. So, but yes, <laughs> yes, okay. To someone that knows the <laughs> private key, yep. Do, do they need to know the generator as well? Uh, yes, they would. Uh, okay. <laughs> No, no, they don't. It's just part of the ciphertext. Okay. Everything they need is in the ciphertext. Okay. So the nonce is embedded in the ciphertext? Yep. Okay. They don't even have to know what it is because it's part of the ciphertext. So. Okay. I'm just double checking myself right now. <laughs> and to someone that knows the private key and then they can decrypt to get the claim. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's all they need is the decryption key and the ciphertext, that's all they need. Okay. So it's a little, from a practical viewpoint, I had envisioned it a little bit that, um, you sort of, the issuer would say, oh, this is the thing I would use the, the encryption on, this this field, like a credit card number. But this is much more flexible than that, which is good and bad because it's harder to use then, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, um, well, I mean. There's ways to lock it down, obviously. Like you could say the message generator is restrict, like is the hash of the claim index that you want to encrypt or something. I mean, you can do fancy tricks like that if if you needed to. Okay. So you could tie it to a specific claim. You could if you wanted to. I mean, there's okay. no reason to in my mind. But you can. I mean, we can, we can do whatever you want. Yeah. To me, it's just easiest the way it is, so keep it simple. Yeah, it's this trade-off between, yeah, you can do anything with it, but how does the issuer and holder and verifier coordinate what, what you're going to use it for? Like, the, the um, party that knows the private key, the auditor, the whatever, they really need to know... Oh, you for know, sure. They need to know what they need to know what they're this. encrypting. Yeah, they need they, to know what's being encrypted for sure. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be a purpose for why you're doing this, and if you make it that oh, you can do anything, then that negotiation becomes a lot harder. Sure. You, you know, having everyone um, familiar with it and why. So that's why where some of the um, you know, having opinions or making it so that you can constrain it to a certain scenario can be useful because then it's easier for everyone to understand what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't want the holder to just say, yeah, I'll give you whatever you want encrypted. Exactly. Back. Exactly. If you want me to encrypt anything you want, I'll I'll just do that. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, from, the, from that perspective, yes, it could be bad. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that was super useful. Um, anything more on verifiable encryption? I think we've covered that one. Uh, equality proofs. Um, so an equality proof is where you've got a claim in two different credentials. 
or and you will with, know what, with the same value well you know what i mean is like let's say you have it in the same credential like maybe this is a health record oh oh okay right? so i want to prove that all the family members have the same last name so you could even do it in the same credential if you wanted it's interesting okay and and basically in the presentation schema you basically would have one reference here and then you would have a second reference in here that would be to another field mm -hmm. or well yeah i i basically allow a list that says this statement this claim this statement this claim this statement this claim so it okay. does multiple. okay and, and remind myself, let's see, we've got this value, which is the set of statements. This is the, no, this is the overall. Presentation ID. Presentation ID. Oh, this is, a, yeah. this is and this particular statement. Yes. And then these are what? Oh, these are separate statements. Each of these is a statement. Correct. And so what you would have in here was a list of other statements mm -hmm. that you want to prove a Q. Do you need any other values other than just the list of other statements? So I don't, I didn't, it doesn't look like I did an example of an equality. Proof, no, you but, didn't. That's but, the problem. <laughs> yeah. So the equality is basically, it's just a list. It, it like, see how it says revocation or commitment or verifiable encryption. It'll say equality. It has an ID and it, then it says reference IDs and it has multiple statements and multiple claims because you can do more than one. Let me find it for you. Yeah, if you could get an example of that. So let's see. I always forget the link. It's hyperledger. So it's got to have a top level ID, a, a set of a combination of top level ID plus statements. Yeah. And those statements have to be in the form of um could must reference a specific it's yeah, it's line. basically a map. So it has statement ID with the claim ID or the claim index, but it could be claim ID too, whatever you want to do it. So it just has a list. It's a big long list. It's an array list of pairs. Yeah. Or it could be a map of pairs, you know, I don't care. However, yeah, yeah. but the, yeah. but the point is you can have more than one. Yeah, yeah, it's not restricted to one, and and it is the only statement type that does allow that. Yeah, you can yeah. Have... So it has its own statement ID. Yep, and then it just has a bunch of reference, and it just has a bunch of references and claims. And a right. bunch of references. Okay. And the only thing we're doing is the equality across them. Yep. The cool thing is it adds zero overhead. What What is the issuer do? The issuer doesn't have to do anything. This is all presentation based. Sorry, not issuer. Sorry, holder. <laughs> oh, the holder, holder handles it. The holder just handles it like any other proof statement, right? There's no extra data that he has to do if that's what you're asking. There's no like setup or anything. Okay, no, but they they have to create a a, a proof statement that references that that takes as input all of these IDs, all of these statements and claims. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the verifier runs some sort of verification. Yeah, well, in every case, how this is the and uh, you know this is a very easy way to think of it. When you're generating a proof, you have the presentation request, right? Mm -hmm. It has yeah. all of your statements, and then the holder has all the private data, which is all their credentials, right? Yeah. And the data that yeah. was signed. Yeah, and then the verifier uses the same presentation request 
But on his side, he has a proof instead of all the credentials and data, right? He just has the the resulting proof and data that was sent. Yeah. And he takes the, the very same presentation request because he's yeah. basically saying, did this, was this proof match this presentation request? Yeah. Yes or no. That's all he gets is a yes or no <laughs> from that side. If there's revealed just, or disclosed claims, obviously he gets that information or any predicates that were disclosed, right? All of that comes through. And this is going to be very similar to the aggregate proof in a non-creds V1, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is the thing that proves the link secret is the same across the credentials. Yes. Well, no, yeah. the aggregate proof proves that everything belongs to one identity. That's pretty much all it does. And that 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 happens with this. Like if you go look at your examples of the final proof that was output, I know you have one. Yeah, yeah. Ah. I know you, Stephen, you can't hide it. Um, What's that? I know you have it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, no, that's the signature, go, go down, go down. No, that's the range proof. Go, keep going, keep going. Right there. The challenge, the challenge basically is the just I just renamed it the oh. challenge. That's essentially what it is, but that's the aggregate proof right there. Same thing. What? Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I thought this was the nonce. Well, the, what the no. heck are you renaming it to challenge for? Okay, what is this? It's called the Fiat Shamir challenge. And non creds V1 had it too. And what it's, is it? It's the aggregate proof, if you want to call it that. And okay, and and what is it? What is the aggregate proof? The aggregate proof is proving that all of these uh, proofs were generated by one holder, one set of holders, or whatever. You know that all the proofs belong to one person, and all the proofs are like a part of the same thing. Think of it and as like a picture over all of the proofs. Okay. It's basically saying these all came from the same generator. Whoever created it did all of these. Um, I, but, it, but it's got nothing to do with the link secret. Nope. Never did. Never did. Never oh, did. man. Okay. And 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 why does what does it do that the how does it prove that? What does it show? Think of the the challenge yeah. or the aggregate proof as a signature over all of the proofs. Because that's basically what it is. It's a schnorr signature over all of the information. Why could I have not gotten a, the proofs from different parties, put them together, and then create a signature over them? Um, well, you could still do that in V1, too. That's not good either way. Why not? It just proves that whoever generated the proof knew all of the data. Oh, they knew the, the raw data? Yes. Okay. Think of it as a way it's grouping it all together because because if all of those proofs were like, let's say one of them was generated last week and one of them was generated yesterday and another one was generated now, that wouldn't yeah. work, right? Yeah. So you want that aggregate proof since that's what, I'm going to call it that since that's what you're used to. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, it, maybe a good way to say is it proves how fresh everything is. Was it generated now, yesterday, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, 10 months ago? The, so it's similar to saying use the same nonce. Yeah, it would basically say, is this a nonce reuse attack or not? Okay. So... In all of the individual proofs, it used the same nonce, and that's proven in this. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So just for my 
simple case, I just basically say the proof re request ID is a nonce. Okay. And okay. I just incorporated that. Basically, I hash, I hash everything, right? I include everything, the, the entire proof request, all the data, all the static, all the dynamic stuff, doesn't matter. I just, I just include everything. All of that is included in that signature. Okay. The fact that it's not tied to the link secret kind of blows me away. I thought that was the thing. So is there anything in V1 that shows that the same link secret was used in all of the multiple credentials produced? Yeah, that's basically, it's doing an equality proof under the hood. You just didn't realize it. It okay. does automatically. This equality proof says it can be for anything. Whereas like in your non-creds V1, the Rust code just did it automatically without even telling you. Okay. So it's there. The only thing I was wondering was that the with a with the blinded link secret, it's it's a layer deeper. Like if I get a credit card number, no, sorry, that's a if I get the name, the names are in plain text in the two credentials. In not in an equality proof. In an equality proof, it just says claim one is the same as claim seven in this other credential. Oh, because you're it's using the you're using the encoded value? Yeah. Yeah, it's a proof. Because if it was plain text, you can just look at it and go, oh, yeah, they are the same. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to push quality. this a little further. Um, it, it, in V1, in the, in the link secret case, each verifier, each issuer gets a different blinded link secret. And, and you're proving that the underlying link secret is the same across them. So it is an extra layer deeper. Well, you can still do that with V2. I, I'm sure you can. I'm just saying it's not quite the same as an equality proof where you're proving the name is the same because there, the basis of the claim is literally the same. Where, you know, what, the, what each issuer handed out was the same. Mike Lauder was handed out to, from each issuer and you're you're checking that's the same here you're getting each issuer is getting a blinded link secret which is different each each one is different and then showing that that was based on the same link secret like the blinded values were based on the same link secret so the equality proof's got to be more another layer of complexity deeper nope right nope it's the exact same proof Really? The, the the verifier does not care whether it was blinded or not during issuance. Blinded only affects issuance. It's the exact okay. same proof. Okay. Okay. I just abstracted it and said, hey, this could be useful for other things than the link secret. Yeah. So in our case, we can just say, we'll always require an equality proof across credent claims for the link secret. But you could also do other things. Like I said, if you want to do a medical claim credential, you could. Like maybe here's all of my dependents and I can prove they all have the same last name. Yeah. And so each of these become so the Yeah, each of these state each statement would have a different one. Okay. Each statement would have a different proof associated with it. Correct. But if the aggregate fails, it doesn't even bother doing the individual ones. It checks. And the you're aggregate saying aggregate the, first. The equality proof embeds both the link secret. Well, it can be used for anything. So you can for a non-creds V1, you guys just implied that there's an equality proof for the link secret. Yeah, it it it, it implied. <laughs> it's there, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're basically just saying we will always put one there. We will always put one there. Okay. 
You can do the same thing for V2 and just say, we're going to, since we require the link secret, we're always going to do an equality proof if there's multiple credentials. Okay. Just do the same thing. It's no different. The math is literally the identical. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to figure out where it's represented in V1. Oh, it's under the hood. You never knew it yeah. was happening. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> okay. There might be more questions on that one. Okay. And finally, the domain proof. Let's talk about that one a little bit. And so a domain proof is where you get a consistent identifier for a verifier, but but the value is different. Um, I assume there's no issuer setup for a domain proof. And and what do you call a domain proof? You call it a commitment, right? I call it a commitment. Yes. The issuer doesn't do anything. It's whoever is collecting the domain proof has a setup. And guess what? It's identical to verifiable encryption and that you, okay. you have, but there's no decryption key. You just create two keys and that's it. So the verifier gives you two keys. So let's, I think we've got right. examples of that here, right? Yeah. That's, you see, uh, right there. Commitment here. So, so the verifier creates the generator. Yep. Both of them. It's, both of them and and you just happen to call them two different things they should uh, have two different values if they're identical yeah yeah, yeah. two uh, different values two. okay um message and blinder yep blinder is used instead of encryption key so that's why I said it's very similar to verifiable encryption. There's yeah. just no decryption key. That's all there is. <clears throat> okay. And the holder does the same thing as, as verifiable encryption. Yeah, pretty much. And and is a specific claim used? Okay, a specific claim is used. And so they would have to know that, well, that claim is going to be consistent every time you use it. So it really doesn't matter which claim you use. Nope. They're using claim three. And then, but they would want to use the same. Same blind, same keys. For every person and every, and for every presentation request they sent, right? Yep, you just use the same keys. Same keys, but remember, they're randomized every time. The proof is randomized every time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a voluntary thing by the holder, right? Yeah. So if the holder left it off, the verifier would say, fine, go away. <laughs> yeah. So... They would have to pick the same claim every time as well to get the same value from the same holder. Right. Yes. Yep. Question. Um, uh, yes, I um I've been enjoying this, um, so I didn't want to interrupt, but I just noticed we're getting on on till the end of yeah. time. And I yeah. wanted to um, ask a question. I was in another presentation of this um, a little while ago, and one of the slides mentioned a call home functionality. That's oh, kind of a, a hot button. So I was wondering yeah. if I understood that correctly, first of all, and then Mike, if you if you could kind of talk about what what's going on there a little bit, so I can know if I need to be happy or worried. <laughs> Steven, so this will be happy. Always be happy. Be happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is for revocation, yeah. Mike. I think this was for revocation, correct? Um, 
So the idea there is that instead of having a public place where the revocation's information is retrieved, like a, a ledger or something like that, you call back to a component that that does it. And so we've got a couple of places where where we can mitigate the call home. But Mike, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. So Stephen, probably what you're worried about is does the verifier call home to the issuer, the issuer learns who presented, and now you're toast, right? Information, exactly. you're in trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not what's happening here. Okay. There's, so let me explain how it works. So <clears throat> one of the problems with revocation is you either have to download a massive list and the it and the holder has still has to disclose something that says I'm in this list, right? That's mm -hmm. how revocation list 2021 works. So yeah, the issuer doesn't know who presented, but the verifier sure does. And it's a correlating identifier, or it can be. Yeah. So um to mitigate that, um you can either download a bunch of changes from a public place, like say a ledger. And then the holder applies a bunch of mathematical operations based on that to become current to say, hey, I'm still not revoked. Or he's going to have to call home. So the downside to downloading information from a public place is it penalizes the holder the longer they're offline. So that's a problem, right? If I go offline mm -hmm. for a year, I have to now download everything from the last year to now, which that does leak information about me because it says, hey, I've been offline for a year. <laughs> right. So that's bad too. So the only alternative was to phone home to the issuer and say, all right, I need you to just make me current. So what I've done in the paper is published. It's called Allosaur. Allosaur says, all right, let's add an additional layer of privacy that says when you phone home, you're not going to disclose who you are either. All the issuer is going to do is receive a proof that says, I'm, a, I hold a valid credential. You don't know which one. And I need you to just give me an up to date result for this version of the accumulator. That's it. So the issuer does not know who's asking to be updated, they just know they're a valid holder of a credential. Now, if this holder is revoked, when he gets the value back from the issuer, it's just going to be invalid. If he never held a valid credential at all, let's say this is an attacker that somehow is able to forge that he had a valid credential, the value he gets back is absolutely worthless unless he knows all of the original values. So only a, a non-revoked holder that knows his values gets back something he can actually use. So privacy is preserved in that he, um, the issuer does not know who's asking to be updated and he doesn't know how long they've been offline. And so you're not penalized for being offline either. So that's what the phone home option is, is the holder is basically saying, oh, there's been some revocations that have happened since I was last issued or brought current. I need to talk to the issuer about becoming up to date but it doesn't disclose who who's asking. Okay, so then the holder is the one making the request. Yep. The issuer nor any verifier know who's making the request. Uh, that's right. So the holder just gets something that brings him current. Now, the verifier, all the verifier knows is, is the verifier saying, are you revoked as of some time, right? Mm -hmm. as of now, as of a week ago, as of 10 minutes ago, you know, whatever that is, right? It's the holder's responsibility to make sure that he's current as of whatever the verifier is asking. So all that information of the holder becoming up to date, the verifier does not even have to know any of that. All the verifier gets in the end is a revoc non-revocation proof that says I'm not revoked, just like in V1. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to go um, well, hold on. read the paper. Hold <laughs> on. 
Well, make sure you don't fall asleep during it because it is quite long. <laughs> um, hold on, holder to issuer. What what information does the holder pass to the issuer in order to get to request the update? Well, we've talked about that in the past. I know. But... I'm just want to go go over it again. Okay. So in a nutshell, he's basically passing. He could be. He's basically passing a signature proof that says I hold a valid credential because you don't probably want anyone to just ask for this. Sure. And then Why to not? what? Why wouldn't you? Well, uh, mostly for throttling, because I could do a denial of service on the issuer that says, give me a bunch of these, right? Oh, it's fair. Optional. Yeah. Let's call that optional. Yeah, it's optional. Okay. Yeah. Um, not required, but that's yeah. just a way of throttling people from asking. So you basically say, well, I'm going to make sure only valid users can ask. But, yeah. that's optional. but in a nutshell, the holder does a Shamir secret sharing split on their say index or element that is in the accumulator okay. and they can do any threshold and any maximum number of shares they want and they can send that to the issuer. So the issuer has no idea if this is the first, if this is the 10th, if this is the 200th, it doesn't matter. And the issuer could also be thresholdizing his side of things. That's the other thing that Allosaur does is it allowed uh, threshold management of the accumulator. But in any case, the issuer just says, oh, I've got an update request. I'm just going to do something and send it back. That's it. There's no MPC involved, nothing. The issuer just does a minor computation, sends it back to the holder. And then when the holder has, say, let's say they did 10 of 20, let's say he's gotten back 12 requests. He can go, all right, I'm just going to burn these two at and then work on these 10. It doesn't matter. And then I'm now current. That's so. Steve, did you catch that? So basically, instead mm -hmm. of calling, so essentially the holder has to send the accumulator plus their element, their contribution to the accumulator. Yep. To the to the issuer, but that would but that would be a unique identifier for the holder. So in order to mitigate that, they send N shares. They they shard their element into shares and send N of them off to the whole, the issuer. The issuer can't reassemble those shares. Mm -hmm. And so they are, that keeps the, um, keeps the element secret. That's what, that's what mitigates the call home. Does that make sense? It it does. I'll I'll have to um, read through it and and ponder it. But in conceptually, it makes sense. I I do have one quick suggestion. Um, so the the phrase "call home" or "phone home" those are becoming politically charged words. I don't <laughs> I don't course. I don't mean like you yeah. know you know red state blue state kind of stuff. What I what I yeah. mean is. There are lawmakers that are actually chasing privacy solutions that are fixated when they hear words like that. Um, and so now that you've explained it, I understand it differently, whereas that was the nature of my question. So yeah. maybe if we could call this anonymous update, uh, the you know, update yeah. the accumulator, sure. something along those lines that doesn't have the word phone or home in it <laughs> Private, privacy respecting revocation update or something i don't know yeah yeah it could be it could be a lot of things um that, that's uh, what it is is the holder just needs to make sure he's current right right no i i i think this sounds good to me other than that's what got my attention because i've yeah. been i've been hearing that a lot from like lawmakers and stuff and so I want to make sure we don't get sideways with that inadvertently. Well, and Steve, the, the reason I wanted to actually use that was because that would be a disaster if this is if that was specifically how it worked. And 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 the problem is. You are going back to the issuer to get updated information, you're just doing it in a privacy preserving way. Yeah, but and so. so that's the do, difference. Yeah, no, that, and that's fine. I mean, the 
if 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 a verifier is asking to prove that you're current within 30 days or something and yeah. you have a regular setting in your app that updates that accumulator weekly or you know whatever time to live you you set for it then all of a sudden that's a regular predictable occurrence and is not really giving any new information so there's yeah. there's ways that you can mitigate that so that it isn't a um you know i'm i'm verifying this right now so you know then you can start to put data points together um so i like the description and and that's my only comment on that is yeah if we could just kind of change the name and then when somebody says well what is update the accumulator is that a phone home because that's a yeah. logical question then yeah. everything you guys just described right here would would be a really nice uh description so okay. maybe we say private private update revocation update versus yeah no i, li I like actually this i like this <laughs> anonymous update yeah okay yeah, yeah. Um, might have to add what what you're updating, but yeah, you're updating the revocation. Rev I call it revocation handle or witness, whatever we want to call it. <clears throat> yeah, that's Something all like that. Yeah, um, and I would I would I would re recommend we don't say hey we we'll just update on a periodic table say once a week because yeah. no matter what we do you can't hide time right yeah mm -hmm. so anybody observing would be able to say, hey, I've noticed this from this IP address, they're asking for a revocation update on Sunday at 10 a.m., right? You can't hide that. <laughs> no map right. cryptography is going to hide that other than encryption, but suppose suppose it was all done in the clear because the because the attacker somehow did a man in the middle, right? <clears throat> that That's the scenario I try to plan for in worst case is yeah. suppose an attacker can see everything, can he still learn who I am? Yeah. Right. Oh. And Mike, one more question. If I send N shares in a single message, so I send one message, but I send an array of shares, mm -hmm. th there's still no way for the issuer to put that together to, to get a, the unique identifier, correct? No, because, well, because the thing is the issuer <clears throat> doesn't know what index those shares belong to. Each of those shares exactly. belong to a unique index. So he doesn't know yeah. the index. And also, if you wanted, I could throw garbage shares in there. So you, right. you can't tell the difference between garbage shares and valid shares. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to make sure. Um, I, I, you've told me that before. I just thought this was a good time to check it again. Um, and that, and the reason I say that is because then you can do it in a single um, request response transaction versus the holder sending 20 messages and then getting 20, 20 replies. Well, because when we designed the protocol, we were, you know, you have a yeah. revocation manager with a decentralized network. So yeah. the holder could talk to 30 nodes and those nodes yes. don't have to talk to each other. So that was the goal in mind. Was yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you, could, you could do what you're suggesting, not that I would, but you could do it that way. Exactly. Okay. All right. We're over time. Uh, this was a great conversation, Mike. Thanks. Um, probably this is my plan for next week is to go... Um, I do want to get some of these into um, write-ups um, and, and start to build out the B, the V2 spec with details. That's what the goal of these sessions are. Um, next one I probably want to talk about is um, claim schema format. Thanks all. Um, I'll post the um, recording as soon as it's done. Cool. Have a delightful day. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Mike. Yeah.